What's up? We're back. What's up, Alex? We are back. Not much, man. Not much. Been super busy. Super busy. Well, and and also uh, this time I should say we're back and on time. That's new and different. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, for the uh, hiccup. It's, I'll, I'll take some uh, blame on that one. Kyle deciding to, you know, not work for a week or two ended up with uh, a little delayed you start. Kids unsupervised. That's what happens. Right, right, right. Um, so, guys, I am really, really, really excited for today because it, it's a topic that obviously gave birth to the accountability bat in figuring out how we can measure objectively and make decisions in business that ultimately decide, are we meeting our targets? Are we doing right by our customers? And are we making money, right? We're not uh, internal sysadmins. So it was serendipitous for service leadership to release their 2023 profitability index that has been a way to kind of make sure the winds are heading in our direction because while correlation doesn't equal causation, understanding your market allows you to dominate your market. So Peter, we really appreciate you hopping on to talk about this report and honestly all the work at service leadership to provide something like this. Well, thanks for having me, Kyle, Alex. Great to see you guys. Welcome back from your honeymoon. Yeah, right. Uh, definitely an exercise in discipline, uh, not working while uh, on some island in Greece with only one megabit a second internet. I think that was the only thing that kept you from working. So we'll, we'll let oh, you get away with that. Totally. I know you did. I already know you did way too much work while you were there, but that's okay. <laughs> so um, for new, those new to our session this week, uh, quite simply, oh man, come on. Canva. There we go. Uh, my name is Kyle Christensen. I've been in our space for the last 20 years in retail and as an MSP, uh, as a vendor. Um, and I'm really just here to find different ways to give you guys content and education to growing your MSP and sometimes in out of the box ways. Like I like to say, the only thing that matters in your business are the numbers at the top and the bottom of your PL. We just need to use that a way to think a little bit smarter. And as with me always, Alex, who are you these days other than hashtag unemployed? You know, I'm, I'm trying to spend a lot of time unemployed, but I keep getting dragged into things like this. So here we are. Um, so yeah, uh, Alex Farling, I spent uh, 16 and a half years as an MSP. We were actually uh, Baring McKinley partners and used the service leadership index through Baring McKinley for quite a while. Um, I was also the co-founder over at Lifecycle Insights. So we built a VCIO, an account management tool. Um, spent a lot of time talking about sales and account management and those kind of things. So that'll play nicely into all of today's conversations. Uh, lots of lots of good sales points here in this uh, in this service leadership report. And and I could comment all day long on that, but let's get to our amazing guests today. Peter, uh, man, Canva's not cooperating. Peter, tell us a little bit about kind of your background. I was introduced to once, Kyle, at a, a speaking event by the MC as having a background that's colorful and strange. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't sure what to make of that, but I think on hindsight, it's actually probably a pretty accurate description. Um, most recently, I joined uh, ConnectWise Service Leadership in 2021. So uh, it'll be two years next month. And prior to that, I uh, took over an MSP in 2010 and ran that from uh, 2010 to 2021 when I joined Service Leadership. Um, in the past, I've also was a uh, prior to that, I was CEO of a financial technology firm for seven years. That was a rapid growth fintech and um, uh, done various other sales leadership and law. I'm a licensed attorney, uh, been corporate counsel, so uh, been all over the place. But most relevant to here was 12 years of running a, a large MSP. When I took it over, it was a $2 million MSP losing a million five a year. And I uh, took that up to, um, when I left that MSP was doing about 17 million and today is way past that doing really well, so. And that's why I love you, man. You and I have a very similar experience in that four to five X growth in a real short amount of time, but you can't do that without knowing where you are and where you're going, right? No, really critical. Um, and really uh, today, the the MSP space is so much different than it was back in those days. As you'll recall, we were all trying to figure out 
is this a real business? What's the, it, it, do we, are you better off selling to more vend, having more vendors to sell to customers? Are you better off having more managed service offerings? So you have something to appeal to everybody or, or not, and how do you price it? And, um, can you ever really get away from, uh, uh, billable hours and block time? And how, I mean, all of us were still trying to figure all of that stuff out. Um, today, anybody who's coming into this space today has a huge advantage because the amount of information that's available on what works and what doesn't work is is incredible compared to what it was. So, um, so yeah, it's been a it's been a really interesting ride. A, a lot of our ability to turn the business around back in 2010 and 2011, and ultimately be acquired, and we did three acquisitions during my time there. All of that stuff was made possible because we discovered peer groups and benchmarking back in 2011. So all of a sudden we had a really quick view into what we were doing wrong and some things that we were doing right, actually, that were a little bit ahead of the curve. So um, so for us, uh, for me personally, I'm a believer that we would not have been able to turn the company around and achieve the growth and success and provide so many employees the opportunity to put food on the table and take care of the amount of customers that we were ultimately able to had we not discovered benchmarking and peer groups back in 2011. So I'm almost a religious level believer in what we do. Yeah, it's 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 a fun th thought when we rewind way back then, because when I converted from retail to managed services, I came from a world so used to having things, and we're gonna talk about it later, of forecasting and budgeted and right budget to actuals like was like the most religious thing that we were always discussing on the growth of not just a store but a region and a territory and the whole company and when i came over into the msp world right when it came to growth it was always an easy exercise of inputs and outputs but really managed services was so early into our cash flow model and what it would end up looking like that there wasn't really any historical date data to look at and I had fun actually a few weeks ago, I did a YouTube video all on like, hey, every MSP employee needs to kind of know where we came from type video. And I walked through how we were mainframe guys to sys admins to retail, right? Brick and mortar. Alex, I know you, your MSP started in brick and mortar roots. And we, we all did. had to go and through this journey. Yeah, I mean, I've been the same place you are, right? I, I ran a Foot Locker when I was when I was 20 years old, right? And worked for Bell Atlantic 9X, which is now Verizon. Um, and all of those places, you have budgets, you have forecasts, you have same store sales numbers, you know exactly where you're going and where you're headed. And I'll never forget when I met my fiance, one of the first things she ever said to me, I was bragging that I was a small business owner. And she says, really? Do you have a budget? And I went... <laughs> And I just hung my head and quit. And she still talks to me to this day. But uh, my answer of no, but I just know, like my gut tells me where we're at and we're good, uh, was apparently a terrible answer. It's the, as Michael Gerber would call it, the accidental entrepreneur that thinks their craft is enough to get them going, right? 100%. Yeah, before we, can... we started the benchmark in 2011, I was, I, I was almost at a point where I believed that it wasn't really possible to make money in this industry that all of these MSPs all <laughs> over the place existed because you had a, a techie owner who wanted to work with a bunch of his buddies. And, uh, and they were taking, as long as they were making enough to pay everybody and keep the lights on that, that was, that was what the managed service business was. Um, Peter, I don't, I don't, I'm not okay with you attacking me like that, but uh, it's like you were at my <laughs> MSP when we started. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're uh, too unique in that regard, Alex. I think uh, that was a huge segment of the industry. Frankly, today, um, we still have a lot of MSPs that are run by uh, very smart, techni technically minded individuals. And uh, by definition, they're also entrepreneurial. They were willing to go out and hang a shingle. Um, but there's still, in a lot of corners of the industry, there's still a lack of understanding of some of these business practices that really help drive business maturity. I and you see it all day long. That's an unfortunately very fair criticism of a lot of us in this space. Well, and I, I will give a little counteract to that, though, because sometimes I do still work with the CPAs of the world. I still have a client that's in marketing agency. That entrepreneurial thing, right? If you go back to Michael Gerber and Emith, that's still a very valid item to where when you do start a services company because it's your craft, 
it's not a huge stretch of the imagination to think that you're not going to know anything about business. It's hard to take off my professional hat and go, okay, now I'm a business owner, which means I care about all aspects of your cash flow, which is my find work, do work, and get paid. Right? There's three major functions of your company. It just takes so long for some of us to get there, and some of us are quicker at it than others. Um, yeah, I don't think it's different in our industry than others. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm an attorney, and there's a whole lot of attorneys that go out and hang a shingle and all of a sudden have to discover things like G&A expense and really start to understand and uh, how the math drives um, gross margin and gross profit and what ends up on the bottom line. And uh, attorneys, there's an old joke, attorneys are only good. The only thing they're good at with math is dividing by a third. Um, the uh, so, I, so I don't think uh, if you, you could look at other industries, doctors, uh, dentists, etc. And I think it's, it's something similar. But the good news is today, in our industry, we have a business model that works. It's established. We know what KPIs you should be measuring. Just like with you guys in retail, you you had a very, very established KPIs on, on sales per square foot and other things that you're looking at um, and what your turn is on inventory. And today we have those KPIs. That's what that's what service leadership does. So um, it's a, well, it's a different about world than it was. But let's talk about this this index thing that you guys got have had going on. Obviously, Alex and I are very well aware as we both used it in our MSP days. But you know, Peter, one thing we should mention is if you guys want to see this report, and Peter, maybe you want to introduce this. It's like what two hundred pages? Uh, uh, actually, I think it tipped the scales just over three hundred this year. <laughs> um, so last year it was two fifty, and I was told it was too long, and we needed to slim it down and this year we came in at 300 but the good news is we did come out starting last year with an executive summary version and i think that's 12 pages um and that's that's complimentary you can uh, hit the qr code here and you'll get a copy of that or you can buy the full one and the full one really is where the the real uh value is going to be it's where we go deep on some of the things we'll be talking about today cool well we we appreciate that and kind of to give a little bit more of analysis, what, what is this index and benchmarking that you guys have built? Yeah, service leadership was started uh, by Paul Dipple back in the day to provide a, objective data on the industry's performance. So back then it just didn't exist. There was a lot of data you'd hear from vendors or from others, but uh, there wasn't a truly objective source of data. So service leadership index is the, um, is our quarterly benchmarking product. Um, you'll hear it referred to as SLI um, frequently. And every quarter providers from all over the world put their financial and some operational data into our system. And every quarter we look at who's the best in class. And our definition of the best in class is the top 25% of uh, profitability. Um, and we do that in 10 different business models. So our two largest uh, sample sets are MSPs, which is defined as 40% or more of your revenue is coming from infrastructure services. And the largest bucket of that is, is managed services. Um, and then uh, VARs or product centric, which is defined as 60% or more of your revenue is coming from product. Um, we also, though, benchmark other infrastructure services models, and we benchmark uh, application development as well. So um, it's all over the world. We have um, providers in uh, Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand. I think our annual profitability report said that since we've been doing benchmarking, we've benchmarked IT providers in 102 countries. Um, so it's it's uh, the best source of objective industry data. Um, and if you put your data in, you get a report back that shows how you did compared to your historical performance, but also compared to best in class. So there's about 60 KPIs that it'll tell you things like uh, your percentage of gross margin that you're spending on sales or marketing or G&A, um, what your service gross margin should be, product gross margin. So uh, really, really helpful and at a level that almost any provider at any size can get a benefit from. And What's fantastic about this too, though, is it, it's a level of understanding 
to not only the norm, but what we can look at in the future, right? There's always that forward looking aspect that we miss as business owners. And whether it's, hey, the norm as in my competitors might be operating this way, they may be in the bottom quartile, there's an objective ability to say, hey, am I going to outprice myself in the market? Am I operating not too high of a gross margin, right? Am I flying too close to the sun there? Um, or at the same time, am I not, and Alex and I actually, this goes back to one of our very first calls, uh, episodes, was am I not spending enough on sales and marketing, right? Am I actually not treating that as a budget that I need to spend because it's what best in class uh, performers are using to grow their organization? But I think we would also be remiss to not have a conversation about how you read this data, right? What lens do I want to read to it? Because I said earlier in the episode, right, our friends in statistics, correlation is not causation. So how typically, Peter, do you recommend and or do you recommend for for MSPs to read this data? Oh, uh, are, in terms of their benchmarking data or the industry Just interpretation overall, overall you know, using it to make decisions in their business. Yeah, I, I think you want to start, with, first of all, you're trying to use the data to understand uh, where to improve. Obviously, that's where everybody uh, seems to start. But you also want to use the data to understand where you're maybe doing things right um, and where you should keep doing the things that you're doing today. Um, you talked earlier, Kyle, about um, about comparing yourselves to others in your market. And my experience is that there aren't too many that are flying too close to the sun and with too high of gross margin and too high of profit. <laughs> uh, that's usually not the issue that we see. Um, the, the bigger issue is um, at, at any given time, about 25 to 30 percent of the MSP market is losing money today. And so you've got companies and, and they're not doing it every single quarter because they won't be able to stay in business forever. Um, but you'll see every quarter, we'll see 25, 28, 30 percent of the market losing money. What's important about that is those are your competitors as an if you're an MSP and you're figuring out what to do for pricing, that's who you're competing with. And um, I, I would frequently, I had seven sales reps um, when I left. And um, if I had a dollar for every time I had a request, something along the lines of, well, well Peter, they really want to go with us. They're a good fit for our target customer profile size wise. Um, they're looking at us and they're looking at competitor uh, XYZ and competitor XYZ is 25% less than we are. What is it that they they know about running their business that we don't know? Yeah, and can we match? Um, I, I used to say the thing that they know about about their business that we don't is how to go out faster, right? They, they know how to go broke right. faster than we do. And and I used to tell that to prospects like, hey, I understand somebody's way cheaper than us. There's always going to be someone who's in a hurry to go out of business faster than me. Um, but you guys can actually help us quantify that. Yeah, you bet. Um, and there's a whole bunch of providers out there that are making 1%, 2% uh, of profitability every quarter. So I like to refer to those as uh, they're flying their plane at treetop level. And um, that's not a great place to be if there's a downdraft, right? Um, so, but you, but you also have a huge segment of the market today that's doing great. Um, the last three years have been remarkably good for the industry. Uh, this year, we're off to an excellent start to the year. Q2 was one of the best quarters I've seen on record. Um, and so figure out what those folks are doing, right? It's not that they're better technologists. I, my experience is that the guys, the MSPs that are pulling top quartile profitability, they're not better at supporting 365 or doing uh, other, other things. Maybe they're better at onboarding and they're better at some efficiency process-based stuff, but but there's pretty good technologists and folks who are working really hard who are not making money or, or making one or 2%. They change a few things in their business um, and they execute with some discipline on some things in their business. And some of those might be some tough choices they got to make, but at some point that's ultimately, I think the biggest differentiator is I'm sick of losing money or I'm sick of working as hard as I'm working and barely making money. 
we're going to fix this, right? I mean, whenever, when you get to that standpoint, whether you're running an MSP or you're running uh, other types of businesses, that's when you start to see things really change. And you, what's funny about, or what I really find inspiring in this is when, right, a lot of what we're, we're focusing on our service models economy of scale, right? That's the primary service delivery. And I used to make a joke that managed service provider or MSP stood for mediocrity service provider. And it wasn't to be offensive, but it was to have that assumed knowledge that what we're providing for is a service that a small business needs that they can't normally afford by bringing it in house. So by virtue, they know it's an economy of scale service. They know it won't be one to one with what a sysadmin would do in their organization. But we have to find a way to respect our costs because respecting our costs allows us to ensure gross margin, not looking at it from a reactive, right, to do the Mike McCallowitz math of revenue subtract expenses equals profit. Well, if I do revenue subtract profit equals expenses, now I have a way of doing the math to understand my budget. Where does my budget to deliver said service at a said price that my market will bear? And I recently did a video on markup versus margin because markup is something we don't talk about a lot in our channel, in our space. But the big key difference is when you measure markup, you're saying, what is the amount that I need to add to my costs? Where margin, right, is what am I getting as a result to my revenue? So it's really deviating those two concepts. And when you start looking at markup a little bit, not that it's a better number, that they're both the same number getting the same result, but it gives me a perspective of I have to make a certain amount of money based off my costs. Yeah, I mean, we talk, uh, we're margin guys, and um, we focus in on product and service uh, gross margins. Uh, in fact, there's a section in the report that you might have uh, geeked out on a little bit, Kyle, this year, um, talking about the decline in service gross margin and um, yes. and how it's tied to projects uh, specifically. Um, so we see all that data. One of the things that you asked earlier, how should an MSP approach the data? Um, my advice to, to successful MSPs and MSPs that are less successful is the same. And that is pick two to four things a quarter that you're gonna focus in on. Don't try to go into the data and we're gonna attack every single part of our business. Go in and really look at where should our product gross margins be specifically how do we set the KPI on that? And how do we hold our people to that? How do we pay our sales reps to that? And let's start measuring that. That's gonna be our thing this quarter and maybe one other thing. And focus in on it, go deep on it. Maybe it's QBRs, maybe it's paid assessments, but really figure out what are those two to four things a quarter we're gonna work on. Um, in Sleek, we talk about those as operational maturity level traits. And if you do two to four a quarter, by the end of the year, you fundamentally changed eight to 16 parts of your business. That's a lot. Um, and so uh, if you're doing well, you focus in on improving and getting to the next level in those things. If you're not doing well, if you start to fundamentally change some of those things, two to four a quarter, it, it won't be long before you'll really start to see the needle move. Um, it, you'll see your business over two to four quarters really start to change and your results start to improve. So, you know, a 300 page report is a lot of information to digest. You just said pick two to four things a quarter to focus on them. That brings up the question, how does an MSP know where to start? Right? How do we yeah. develop it? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Alex. Um, so the report, the report's certainly fine for that. Um, we have some special sections that I would advise starting. One of them was we did a deep dive on five different operational maturity level traits uh, out of Sleek. And we now have a, a huge population using Sleek and that we were able to uh, correlate profitability to specific OML levels within those specific traits. Um, what we did with that was we we show the analysis, but then we also provide three to four pages of guidance on how to implement those things in your business. Um, if you go into if you become a Sleek subscriber um, and you go into Sleek, there will be white papers and webinars and other things that will go even deeper on how to improve those things. But I would maybe start there. Second, 
is while it's 300 pages, don't be too intimidated by that. Um, because we cover multiple different business models, you don't need to read through all of the detail and all of the performance on every business model. If you're a VAR, go right to the VAR section. Maybe go to the MSP section next if you're trying to become more of a more of an MSP. But you don't need to spend any time in the application development sections or some of the other business models that we talk about in there. So, so don't be don't be too intimidated by that. Um, second is if you if you start to benchmark, you're going to see your specific data compared to the industry. And that's where it gets really, really valuable. Um, uh, for me, I'll give you a specific example, a war story from my past. When I first started in 2010, we were running about 13% margin on product. And um, it was about a million dollars of our business. Um, and so we were, that was uh, not that much margin, right? Um, and I had come from a business that was running regularly uh, way higher margins than that. And I couldn't believe how low this was. But my sales reps and my sales leadership um, just beat me over the head that that's all we can get, Peter. You know, customers can uh, comparison shop us to against Dell and others online. And it's a service business. Uh, we got to make all our money on service. We can't make any money on, on hardware and other and uh, software product so i said but after about six months i stopped fighting that like okay clearly i don't understand this industry this is what it is i've got to accept 13 points is it's about what we're going to get then we started to benchmark i got my first benchmarking report and at that time best in class was 23 percent. so i came back with the book with the book and said to my uh, SEs and my sales team, hey guys, how are they able to get this? And we can only get 13%. How are, th this is this is best in class, it's right here. So we decided at that point, we were gonna set our new target at 23%. And within about two months, we started to hit it. Minimal customer issues. We had a few customers push back and we were able to work through it. Um, but we were able to hit it when it went, when best in class continued to go up. I think uh, today it's about 27%. We never missed it after that. And, and just going from 13% to 23% was an additional 100K to our bottom line. We didn't have to do anything else. We didn't have to write any more contracts. There wasn't any additional work. It was just strictly bottom line. And that's that's the kind of stuff that helped us understand where we needed to improve. Um, well, I think and... that, that goes to a point that's bigger than service leadership, right? It's 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 this what gets watched gets done. And when we become super reactive in our MSP and we just go from ticket to ticket to ticket and, and forget to build in this process where we set KPIs and, and aim for goals and review them regularly, we become that way less than best in class, hopefully at least average business that is really struggling because we're just running from ticket to ticket and not being strategic. Yeah, and for me, that was part of the value of getting the report book uh, back every quarter was if it gave me those KPIs and we were able to build those into our management KPIs and into incentive plans. Well, and to kind of get started getting into the data that I, I'm spotlighting today or Alex and I are spotlighting today, Right, right off the bat, the statement of a quarter of MSPs are losing money, right? That, that that should not come at a surprise from what we're talking about right now, because if it's not managed, it's not, or if it's not measured, it's not managed, right? Alex, you said it a lot more eloquently than I did, um, but there is a level to where because we think sometimes with our skill set, our technologist ways, we don't realize that there is a level of money that we need to make. And sometimes that's accountable to ourselves because if I have an entrepreneurial spirit, I'm going to hang that shingle. I need to get an ROI from the time I invested to just get this thing off the ground. So, yeah, it's, it's really critical. Um, it's most MSPs, my experience is MSPs are owned by and staffed by employees who are very focused on helping, helping customers. And the notion of, of every prospect not being a good prospect and saying no and saying uh or holding the line on pricing these are 
these are uh, not muscle memory things for the average MSP owner or um, employees. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's some challenges to it, but it's, and there's some things that don't come naturally, but you can overcome those through knowledge. Um, and MSPs are really good at learning. Um, their employees, their leadership, they're good at learning what they need to be doing to take care of a customer's technology better. Well, the same the same uh, principle holds true with learning how to run your business better. There's information out there. You learn, you make decisions, you get better, you move forward. Well, or it's an exercise in what you're comfortable with. And Alex, I'm sure you dealt with this a lot at Lifecycle Insights. Sometimes we're only comfortable with selling hardware or selling extra hours for projects because it is us as the technologists that are able to speak to those things. But at the end of the day, when we blend margins, right, sometimes that can work outside of our favor. Yeah, we saw it a lot. And, you know, the other thing that we saw was folks were so focused on the service side of the business that they can't even make time for selling these other things. Right. It, it literally is just, well, we'll replace it when they get it, when the customer gets around to it or, you know, we'll deal with it when it comes, when it blows up in our face, we'll go tackle it. Um, and the difference in margin again, and I think service leadership has some stats on this somewhere with the folks who take that strategic approach and get out in front of it. You know, they're making 13, 14 percent more EBITDA just by having quarterly business reviews, real strategy with your customer, getting out there and doing these things because you're going from that reactive mind shift to that proactive mind shift and it just automatically turns into now we sell product and make money on it. Now we make sure that everything is modern and up to date and we just run a better business because we're strategic. Well, and, and Alex, it's funny because one of my stories that I loved so much was one of the clients I remember, I, it was a agency, a, they were a travel agency uh, in San Diego and they ended up getting me about, they were about, a, they were at a larger client, they had about a hundred users. And the reason that they were looking for a new MSP was they had an outage and they found out that the outage was from a switch that was like 12 years old. It was like five years on the end of life scale past due. And they were so upset, not at the outage, but at the negligence. And when they came to us, the first thing they asked us is, how do you manage the future? For us, how do you manage what might happen tomorrow, not what's happening today? They said, "Yeah, our computers are going to break. We expect that. We're going to have employees sitting there twiddling their thumbs because, whatever, right?" But what we want to make sure is that we can do whatever we can to minimize that. And it, it, mm -hmm. it's 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 going into sometimes we're looking down too much, and and sitting on a twelve year old piece of tech isn't looking into the future at all. That is, it's negligent. Right. We knew that was going to blow up one day and every day it got older, that that uh, that likelihood exponentially increased. Yeah, I think there's oftentimes a uh, I'm going to make a decision for the customer for them to not that they're not going to want to spend this money. And because and um, it's important for MSP owners and salespeople to understand that the customers that you want, they're viewing IT strategically. They understand that. This is something that's critical for them to achieve their business objectives. So they want you to tell them what it's going to take to do that. Um, and don't make the decision on their behalf. Don't be afraid to go in with the number because of the size of the number or whatever it is. You should be working with your accounts every quarter doing QBRs. And those QBRs should include an IT roadmap that gives you 12 to 24 months of budget and projections of what you're going to need to do. Um, even if the number is big, the, trust me, the CEO would rather know early than find out later. Um, and, and I say this as prior to joining, uh, taking over the MSP, as I said, I was CEO of a fintech company. The level of frustration that I had with IT spending cannot be properly put into words. Um, <laughs> it was an annual exercise in, fr in incredible frustration. And it was because it wasn't because of the amount, it was because of the uh, lack of anticipation of the amount and the inability to budget for it. It was so, like, hey, can like, I buy it tomorrow? Can I buy it tomorrow? Well, you have right, six grand I could spend right now. It's the normal, how does an MSP enter the room? Knock, knock, surprise, I need money. 
Um, <laughs> and you know, if we're doing that to our customer, we're, we're really setting them up for failure. But the reality of it is the thing that we've never really talked about is that the only person who understands all of your customer's technology well enough to build a budget for it is the MSP. Nobody at the customer can inventory all the technology, understand everything they own, and really sit down and build a total budget forecast for the next 6, 12, 18 months other than you. So if you're not doing it for your customer, guess what? They're incapable of doing it for themselves. And when you sit down with the spend and go, hey, this is the elephant we have to eat, which when do you want to take your first bite? Um, that's way easier than saying, hey, I just need money from you. Well, and at All the end I of the day, our companies, want to spend money? right? Our, our clients are small businesses for the most part as well, right? They are operating within their own constraints. They're operating with their own budgets. They're, they're operating knowing that this is not a cost of goods. This is something that we have to spend to keep the lights on in the organization. And we are going to have to put money into it. Anyone that's not thinking about technology at this day and age, they're probably going to go the way of the dodo. And, you know, I said the B word, so I think this is a, a good time to kind of bring up this point that you bring up, I think, in the special section or the, the special features. I don't remember what you guys called it, Peter, um, but around you made a statement in here where high performing TSP set a budget each year. Absolutely. Yeah, the budget, there's a, some best practices with budgeting. Um that we teach, uh, first of all, do it, it should be done every year and it should be done before your fiscal year starts. So don't wait until the close of the previous year to start your budgeting process. If you do that, you will forego at least a month, if not a couple of months of time in the new fiscal year that you should be using to hit, to hit the ground running. Um, so start ahead of time. Um, and for most MSPs, if your fiscal year is January, that's calendar year, um, you're going to want to start working on your budget and probably early to mid-October. Um, after you know your Q3 results, start building a pro forma, anticipating your Q4. Um, build it. And, um, and when you're done with it, and if you want to wait till the year fully ends to update with actuals, go ahead. But when you're done, lock it in. Carve that thing into stone like Moses coming off Mount Sinai with the commandments, the, it, your budget's your budget. It doesn't matter if there's a global pandemic. It doesn't matter if you lose some key people or you lose your best sales rep or whatever. A, a budget should stay in uh, locked in for the course of the year that you should have to deliver on it. Um, there's always going to be negative effects that are going to come along. And so uh, you don't want to get in the habit of redoing your budget mid-year based on, on negative impacts on, on the on business. Um, second thing we recommend is double uh, A budgeting, which is aggressive but attainable. Um, so the Jim Collins stretch. Of, yeah, stretch uh, I think stretch to a degree. Um, you, you want a budget that if if you really uh, do well and some things go right and your team does a great job, you'll be able to achieve. You don't want to do BHAG budgeting. Um, I'm a huge fan of Jim Collins. I love Good to Great, one of the best business books ever. But it's a big mistake to apply the concept of a BHAG to a budget because another uh, best practice that we teach is to tie in executive compensation and manager compensation to achievement of EBITDA in your budget. Um, and if you set a BHAG as a budget goal, you're gonna, it's going to lead to highly demotivated executives later in the year when you come, sh come up short. Um, you want to have a budget that, again, uh, it don't, uh, it don't sandbag it. Make it so that it's challenging and it requires your team to, to achieve some great things to hit it. But it shouldn't be something that requires everything to come out perfect and the uh, moon and the sun to line up uh, exactly right. And um, and the concept of doing a BHAG with a budget is a bad idea. Well, and it's a going back to if it's, you know, if it's measured, it's managed. There's also a level of expectation setting to where, like your example with uh, product margin going from, I think you said 13 to 23 percent, somewhere in there. If yep. I tell my sales team, hey, here's your budget for when you are selling product and you have to hit, hit this margin. They're going to ask the question, well, how do I do that? And that's the best question that they can ask in your business by 
by any amount stretch of the imagination because now they're trying to solve for that destination. And that's why I put this quote up here to the person who does not know where he wants to go. There is no favorable wind, mainly for this exact reason, where if you say it's 23 percent, now they have to figure out how to achieve that. And it's not just best results or best case scenario. It's it's not a hope and pray. And in some cases, like you mentioned, if you have a variable pay model, they're going to probably be putting quite a bit of more money in their own pockets. And you see this so often in, uh, I've been really obsessed lately with self-motivation theory to where when you start to have those stretch goals, not BHAG, but just a little bit more harder to attain than normal, you actually get more motivation out of your employees because they have to stretch their own skill set, which us as worker bees, as human beings, right, worker ants, we, we get motivated by having a challenge. And some of us, sometimes we forget that as business owners, we want to make it easy because we think that's a better employee experience. But a lot of times that just gets people complacent and they're bored. Yeah, yeah. Uh, set it so that you're going to challenge your organization. Uh, the slide that you're showing there out of our annual report shows um, 2022, the budgets were crazy high. Um, normal budgets that we see on average growth is about 12%. Um, 2022, it was, uh, budgets came in at about 19%, which we thought was in borderline insane. Um, but then uh, the providers came really close to hitting that. I mean, 2022 turned out to be a huge uh, year for growth. So 2023 budgets came back down to earth a little bit. And it's not that it's uh, indicating a recession or anything. Uh, they just came back more to a normal level that uh, that we saw. One thing to mention, um, we're going to be, in, if anybody who attends IT Nation Connect in November, um, we'll be showing a new budgeting pro forma tool that we're building into our benchmarking platform. So anybody who's using benchmarking, uh, we're going to have a tool that will be coming out later this year that you can use to build a budget for 2024 uh, using your actual rolling four quarter data and uh, some AI overlaid into it. It's really cool. So. So in that, though, one thing kind of rewinding back to do a lot of these things, right, we got to be investing in sales and marketing. And uh, yeah. one of the things uh, what's up? I said, ah, yes, I'm f familiar with this data. <laughs> and and Alex and I, we, we did a whole exercise on how you start to budget from a revenue perspective, right? What percent of your revenue are you spending on sales and marketing and showing on how you can use that as a way to justify some of your sales hires. Uh, we had Adam Slutskin on. We talked about some of the BDR hires you want to bring in on your early days if you're going to have to be owner-led sales, right? You want to get yourself to that hunter stage, not the farmer stage. Um, and so what do you, and I know, I, I don't think this is the correct slide, but what are you seeing in best in class from a sales and marketing budget? Um, yeah, it's, a, it, it's, um, I believe about 12% of gross margin, um, is the current best in class. Um, and so when we show, we break out marketing expense, we break out sales expense, and then within each of those, we break out labor and non-labor expenses so um and in the slide that you just had up there kyle um what that shows if you want to pull that back up yep um is in our industry it's expensive to bring on a new client um that and if you look between the best in class the median and the bottom quartile uh, the best in class are actually bringing on the fewest new clients per quarter but they're bringing on uh, cl new clients at much higher gross margin, 52% compared to 42%. Um, and everybody, uh, regardless of best in class and bottom quartile, everybody is spending a fortune per new client. Um, as you can see on that 25,000 up to 32,000 per new client acquired. And when I, when I talk about that data, I, I oftentimes will see the looks of skepticism in the room of partners kind of giving each other the eye of, uh, really 30,000. Um, <laughs> but yeah, think about it. If you, if you think about if it's owner sales, what percentage of the owner's time is the owner spending on sales? That percentage of their, of their salary needs to be allocated towards sales expense. Uh, marketing, when you add up uh, marketing, whether it's in-house or outsourced and you add up your website, HubSpot, 
events, everything that you're really doing on marketing, sales, when you put in mileage and uh, uh, commissions, everything, and you put everything into the soup and divide it up, it's about twenty-five to thirty-two thousand per new customer to acquire a customer. Uh, so, a, Peter, I'm really confused. Soul. I'm really confused here because you used fancier words than me, and I need you to dumb it down for me. It sounded to me like you said owners need to track their time and mileage, and I know that's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, um, yeah, in our system, we teach anybody who comes on in benchmarks. We teach them how to allocate the percentage of their compensation. So, even if it's owner uh, doing, if they're spending fifty percent of their time in sales they should be putting 50% of their salary into sales wages. Um, oh, and so, um, but as you grow and you add sales reps, um, there's a lot of costs that you don't necessarily think about. Uh, that's real, real cost and it adds up. Um, so if you're gonna, if we can all agree that it's gonna be difficult and expensive to bring on new clients, and I think any MSP you talk to will at least agree on that, make sure you're bringing on good quality clients. You're bringing on clients that are higher gross margin, that value IT, that are gonna to listen to what you have to say more, um, and that are gonna stay with you. Um, because what the other thing that that data showed is um, you're gonna use up somewhere between 44 and 89% of gross margin, and that's three years of gross margin on the cost to acquire. So you better have the client with you for a length of time to make up for that cost of acquisition. Yeah, it turns into the customer lifespan gross margin, right? What is their life gross? What is their gross margin over the entire life of the contract, the relationship? And what I love about this too is what we can really honestly say is that whether you're bottom quartile or best in class, the 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 customer acquisition cost really doesn't go down. Right. So don't think that you're really going to make it cheaper because of whatever it takes, longer t time cycles, shorter time cycles, more refined marketing. It doesn't matter. The mousetraps really starts to stay the same. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of a difference, uh, uh, 25 to 32,000, but nobody's at like 5,000 or right, some radically different number. Um, so you can definitely improve it and become more efficient. And, and you should do that. You should be spending money on sales and marketing. Um, but nobody has a magic bullet. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a tough grind to bring on new clients in our industry. Yep. And, and honestly, this goes into the sales cycle conversation of if I'm going to be investing in sales reps that are trying to bring in revenue for the company, not all revenue is good revenue, right? And this is what I, I kind of put on my, my LinkedIn post yesterday where if right, all managed services is MRR, but not all MRR is managed services. And I loved the way that this was phrased because as you start to really break this down, if I'm going to think about number of deals closed, I want the highest number or the highest percentage of blended gross margin that I can possibly have. And Vince actually just asked a question, Peter, for you on, on the call. So he said, so best in class MSP margins about 50 percentish question mark. What is the net profit range of those MSPs? Um, yeah, best in class service gross margin is about 52% uh, currently, 51.9, I believe. Um, and the profit of those uh, MSPs, best in class uh, cutoff in Q2 was 18.4% adjusted EBITDA. The average was 245 Um So best in class um, across the board averaged about 25% adjusted EBITDA. That's a lot. That is. That's a that's that's a good take home. It is, yeah. The other interesting thing with our best in class folks is about eighty percent of them are the same every quarter. So bottom quartile, you see in median, you see this up and down pattern where somebody goes in, they're unprofitable this quarter. Next quarter, they make one percent, so they're in the median, and they're back to unprofitable next quarter. Best in class folks, you don't see that. They're and and it makes sense if you're running your business in a way that you're delivering those kind of results and you're at that high of an operational maturity level, why would you change, right? You're just going to keep uh, improving your business. 
Well, and Peter, when we were in the green room, you and I were kind of having a little banter when it came to gross margin, constraints theory, billability utilization theory. And the the one similarity in all of those models is the only variable cost we have as an MSP truly is our service labor, right? It's the amount of money we are paying our teams to achieve an economy of scale. And there was one slide I actually spotlighted that I love so much because it makes it extremely simple from a utilization pattern is as you get best in class, your utilization shouldn't change. It should be very a real small slope up, but not too drastic because you have gotten your services to a point to where it is like working uh, like clockwork. Alex and I did a whole conversation on onboarding and why you take your biggest hit the first month or two a client is on board, right? Just get all that stuff to be as simple to deliver as possible. But, you know, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts. Really, this is the only way to guarantee gross margin in our industry. Our utilization percentage is massively important. So um, that special section we were talking about, about the decline of service gross margin and the issue with projects, when we when we uh, did a deep dive on it, that's the issue, um, is that you're, what you're seeing essentially is managed services being delivered at a much higher level than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. That MSPs have gotten better at this model. They've improved their measuring utilization. They're providing incentives towards utilization. Um, so in general, they're running their managed service operations better than better than they were several years ago. Uh, they're, they've gotten equally worse at effectively running their project operations. And so, um, so what we've seen over the last few years is real, is a significant and material drop in uh, project gross margin, and it's it's enough where it's dragging down overall service gross margin, even though managed service gross margin is doing pretty well. Um, and so, a, a huge huge factor on this, it, and and we have a slide on utilization uh, showing the importance on. The difference, even if you move from 55 to, to 70 or 60 to 70, the massive difference it'll make um, in your productivity of your service team, um, it, it's hard to overstate it. If you're if you're underutilizing your, your service team and you're coming in at 50, 55, 60%, you almost can't charge enough on your projects to make up for that. Yeah. Um, and, and on that, Peter, I, I always love giving the managed and measured scenario to operations and service directors of here's the margin you need to provide to the organization. And you can variable pay that because now they ask the question of how do I deliver that service for that price? Therefore, this many hours per month. Right. It starts to have you ask that same question like the sales rep getting his margin from 13 to 23 how does now my service manager get his cost to align with revenue at a certain slope? And, and just as a quick promo, guys, um, next week, uh, Todd Kane and I are actually, we want to see your service managers. We're actually going to do a course with your service managers on the issues they're having to better manage exactly what Peter and I are talking about, because this is something that I think you even put in the service leadership report that service management, even in big PE firms, isn't taught well enough or educated well enough in order for them to really actualize the investment of that acquisition. Yeah, I mean, we could go on for hours on the acquisition uh, challenges that come with with effectively integrating and, uh, yeah. all of that. Maybe that'll be another uh, topic for another day. Um, but yeah, definitely, we're seeing a lot of improvement as the industry is maturing. Uh, we did our uh, we brought back our annual compensation report back in uh, March earlier this year. And by the way, we'll be doing that again. Um, anybody who supplies their data starting the beginning of October through the end of November will get a free report again. Um, one of the interesting things we saw there when we went back and compared this year's data to the last year of data that we had, which is 2015, is that management within uh, MSPs has gotten much, much more experienced. So um, the average experience level of the staff positions is about equal. So you're still seeing MSPs running their staff um, operations on less experienced employees. And it's 
frankly, essential to the profitability model that you do. Mm -hmm. um, but within the management ranks, including service management, the level of experience has gone up exponentially since 2015. And that's a huge positive. It's a gigantic positive. I mean, it's the whole idea of, of your economy of scale is you do need lower cost resources that you are able to invest into to maintain that lower cost in order for them to deliver the service because your tier three engineers, they're just gobbling up your margin and you should be able to standardize all of that. Yeah, if you're doing the, we have a special section on OML traits that talks about um, target customer profile, um, tech stack, um, and looks at OML from one to five and looks at the correlation of profitability. If you're doing the right things running your business at a higher operational maturity level, it's easier to bring in more lower cost employees and get them up and running and productive faster. Um, there's less complexity in your environment. And it's not that you can uh, staff your organization entirely with level ones. You certainly need level twos and threes, um, et cetera. But the ratio of them changes dramatically depending on how you're running your business. And that's where you can build in a uh, much higher profitability. Um, it also allows you to run your business with a different mentality. If somebody comes in on a Friday afternoon and has an offer for 30% to go to the hospital or enterprise or whatever, and you need some of that turnover and to be able to wish somebody well and thank them for the years that they've contributed to your organization. That's really different than the panic and having to figure out how you're going to match and all of that stuff that you tend to run into if you haven't run your business in the right way. Oh, and Alex and I have said it so many times, just like sales, you need to always be recruiting. You can't make the process of working for you gross just because I want to elevate my career. Right. Eventually well, they're going to leave your MSP and make it a fun one. Well, that and we've got to find a way to create these, to, to turn these MSPs into talent factories, because every time you lose an employee, you lose some institutional knowledge. And we need to make sure that we're doing the right things, right? Documenting process, create, built running on a real process, but also having ways and methods to get the next guy up to speed quickly. Um, yeah, something right. that I think is, is missing in the space. Yeah, MSPs are uh, uh, really good, uh, generally speaking, at onboarding new customers. Um, we need to be equally effective at onboarding new employees and make sure that we're dedicating appropriate resources, appropriate time, um, mentoring, all the things that go into developing new talent so that when they do come in, it shortens the learning curve, but it also does exactly what you're talking about. It really makes sure that that institutional knowledge gets carried on and that uh, and that you're preparing people and word gets out that, hey, this is a good place to go if you're getting going in your career. These guys are really good at developing their people. They're really good at providing them opportunities for improvement and advancement. And if you get in there and you do well, there's gonna be outside opportunities that are gonna be really good as well. So. Um, it's, oh, and by uh, the way, it protects your profitability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I talk about a lot. It's a mindset. We're in football season right now. It's the mindset between being a college football coach and being a pro football coach. And that is, if I'm a college football coach, my job is to constantly recruit, to bring in new talent every year, to figure out how to develop that talent and get the most out of them. And it's and by the way, to win, to use that talent to be successful. Um, but I know that at the end of three, four, five years at most, I'm going to lose them. That, um, that by definition, they're not going to be able to stay with me their whole playing career. So um, it's uh, it's a different mindset, but it's an important one to adopt as an industry. Yep. Well, we are at time, so I want to make sure I respect everybody that's on this call. Peter, we're probably going to have to have you back, man, because there was like five or six more slides in here that I didn't even get to. I think I could literally talk about this topic all... Actually, I do talk about this topic all day long. Who's Who are we kidding? Um, at this point, I should just get profitability tattooed on my arm and the other one accountability, but we'll figure it out. Uh, so thank you, everyone that showed up. Uh, I'll see you all next week on the service manager call or have your service managers attend. And Alex and I, I think we have in two or three weeks, we'll go ahead and send out the link some fun stuff on education, uh, this whole talent factory idea uh, that we'll be sending out that invite for. So Peter, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for hopping on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Kyle and Alex. Great to talk right, to you both. You.